I don't believe in free speech. I don't believe in free speech. I can't stand what they teach. I don't believe in free speech. I can't stand what they teach. I can't stand what they preach. I don't believe in free speech. I'm like the one person on earth that didn't read the Harry Potter books. So. Oh They're so awesome. <laughs> I know. I just hate that kind of story. I know it's so weird. This she's in the news right now because um because some uh some trans activists um posted a picture. They did like a stunt where they posted a photo outside of her house clearly showing her, her address and then she's just getting like streams of of death threats now. So they doxed her, which puts her life in danger. This little, you know, article I just read um the one that was like just, you know, crazy crazy fucking propaganda you know um about her the first thing it says is like you no know, jk rowling has a long history of transphobia she first came out as transphobic two years ago when she made merciless attacks on trans people and threatened you know and claimed that uh the trans people threatened cis women's lives and 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 put them in danger i'm like wait isn't that what you people are doing constantly <laughs> is saying that like by jk rowling saying i kind of have a problem with what you're saying that's putting Trans lives, and I mean, those, are, you know, the trans community is usually the one that that makes those claims of overstatement of harm, etc. You know, to try to stamp out um, or ruin the life or career of somebody who who asks a relatively intelligent question, and they're not advocating anyone be harmed, and they're not directly harming anyone. At least you couldn't make the argument that someone is directly. Like J.K. Rowling didn't. As far as I know, as far as I know, J.K. Rowling did not um, dox a trans person because they were trans, because Rowling is so transphobic or tr- trans hating. That's much more indirect than the direct thing of doxing Rowling <laughs> online and hoping people harm Rowling. But I get that really, really um, anti-trans or anti-LGBTQ plus in general um, sentiment expressed widely can itself put LGBTQ lives in danger, right? In the same way that if everybody in society sees women as um, objects to be abused, they're more likely to get abused and the abuse gets overlooked and by the whole system, right? So I get that there's some connection to um, LGBTQ plus people thriving, but we also can't stamp out questioning curiosity or act like, uh, a, a series of questions about gender identity and sexuality are settled issues. People don't all agree on how to think about gender and sexuality. They don't all agree on issues of how important pronoun choices and all that stuff. And so that's where I think the the extremists really um, create their own different form of harm, if you will, if I can use the word harm there, because they're they're really acting like certain open questions are settled issues. And they're only settled in their minds. They're not settled like as a society, the way like we've all decided genocide is wrong. Right? But it's not exactly one of those settled issues. A slavery is wrong and bad. That That's kind of a settled moral issue. But a lot of these other things are hardly settled. Because one of the other stories that's in the news right now is um – this is in the news just like a day ago. Um, so Barnes & Noble had a, a table called uh, Unproblematic Wizard Books. And, you know, it's like witch and wizard books that aren't Harry Potter. Unproblematic. And this was in this this uh, this Barnes & Noble was in um, New York City's Union Square. And, um, you know, the article that I'm reading is all about how how problematic and transphobic those books are, how those books are riddled with transphobia. And, of course, there's not a single quote from those books. I've read all those books. Uh, you know, there's there's nothing homophobic or transphobic about those books either, you know, but the thing is they're not even realizing that they're tr- that they, that they're failing to distinguish between essentially what they're saying is this woman is transphobic thus her work is transphobic. 
you know, and it's that same thing of canceling artists because we don't like who the person is. Like we don't want to hear from like an academic who gets canceled can no longer. We talked about this last time, right? And if an academic gets canceled, then we don't want to hear their lecture anymore, no matter what it's right. about. Yeah, even if their their lecture is on a completely different area of expertise. We were talking about what's his name last time? Abbott, um, Dorian Abbott. Yeah, so same thing. So, but the article is written, you know, it's just claiming falsely over and over and over again in print that you know these books are riddled with transphobia. J.K. Rowling has a long history of transphobia. She did this, she did this, and it's just not true. None of it's true, but it doesn't matter because people are sheep. They're fucking stupid, and they just. I mean, like, I love when people go like, "How did the Holocaust ever happen? Are you really? Is that a serious question? Have you ever met anyone?" I keep going like for, for 10 years or however long it's been, I've been going, do you see what's going on around here? This is nuts. And everybody I know just keeps going, well, you know, if you want to make an omelet, you got to break a few eggs, the pendulum. Like you asked, uh, you know, you were asking a couple episodes ago, you know, like where do you – like let's not overcorrect, I think you said. You know, and it's that same thing, you know. I hear people say like, you know, the pendulum swings a little too far you know, in the cause of social progress, we have to, you kind of got to go in swing in it first, but it levels itself out over time. I'm not sure. First of all, I'm not sure that's true politically, just overall, but also what about personally? Like, is it going to swing back and, and give all those teenage girls their boobs back when they realize that they were fucking had? Like the trans cure all angry about life? You know, like America's America's youth, feeling angry, feeling misused, feeling betrayed, feeling like things just don't make sense and are unjust. Become trans. All your problems will be solved. You know, it kind of we are giving that that cure all answer and we're feeding them constant propaganda about how anyone who disagrees, it means this and this and this, you know. And so, yes, I do think I do think that a lot of people are going just like a lot of people stop being hippies, you know. It's like is this really who you are or is this a phase? And of but course, see, I don't believe there is any really who you are. So if someone's trans for three weeks, they're really trans for three weeks. I mean, I because I don't believe there's some inner essence or core to your identity that is just springs out of your uh, genetics. I mean, I believe there are certain dispositions people have. Some people are inherently more conscientious than others. Some are more risk taking and so forth. But I don't feel like it's as simple as are you really this or are you really that? I think people's identities are fluid. And so uh, it, it it's it, but then if if you want to be embraced, don't expect people to embrace you as anything other than fluid. That's my view, right? So if if I'm if somebody you know I know women in their 50s who are in a gay relationship for the first time in their lives. Were they not really straight between ages 14 and 54? Was it all a sham or is identity more fluid than that? The question is, though, there is this weird juxtaposition of biological essentialism and social constructed. You mentioned you, you said you had a student who said they were that she was biologically determined to be only attracted to. To women and trans people. <laughs> and gender right? non-binary. And gender non-binary people. Okay, right. Or like saying, for example, just the basic thing, I was born this way. And, you know, like all the Starbucks baristas a couple years ago before the pandemic, they were all the Starbucks baristas were all wearing Starbucks shirts, official Starbucks wear, where you have a shirt and on the back it says born this way, right? Now, here's my question. Which is it? Is all gender socially constructed. So as a straight cis man, I'm supposed to, I'm the chump, right? I'm the guy who has just not had the balls to question this gender identity that was handed to me by society. But so my gender construction is socially constructed. But if you're trans or if you're gay, that is who you really are. You were born this way. What you said about like if a 50-year-old woman becomes a lesbian, is the rest of her life a lie? I've known a lot of women who – and there is some coincidence here. The kind of women who have had sex with 50 people by the time they're 20, 75% um, of those in bathrooms with men they just met. And then finally they they start sleeping with women and they say, oh – 
my rest of my life was a lie, and that explains I was under the pressure. This is look what society does to people. It forces us to live this lie. I was secretly ashamed of being gay and being trans, and I didn't realize it, so I fucked all these guys, or I let them use my body. They let them use me because I was under all this pressure and I had this bad sense of self. But now I realize that explains everything, and I'm actually gay. And there is that question. If you have sex, like if I went out and had sex with a man right now, I would have to say, you know, even if I didn't say, well, I guess I'm gay, I would have to say, obviously I'm bisexual. You know, I wouldn't, I, I think that it would be homophobic of me to say, you know, I mean, I have sex with guys sometimes, but I mean, I'm not gay or anything. That's like saying like, I'm not a racist. I just don't think black people should be treated the same as white people. Well, that is racist. And there are that, that incredible double think. You hear it all the time from people like, don't get me wrong or anything. I'm not a racist or I'm not this or I'm not that. Well, it's the same. There's that thing where you're saying like, you know, lesbians who think of themselves as like <laughs> lesbians who say they're not women and thus they're straight. Like one of them says they're a man and now they're straight. I've heard a gay man say, isn't that homophobic? Right. Well, there's a lot of people who've criticized that. In some ways, back then in the 60s and 70s and into the 1980s, trans people were the ultimate gender conservatives. That was one of the critiques of the trans movement coming from, yes, feminists. And that, that sort of feminist trepidation about um, transgender dates back to feminists being the ones who criticized the gender binary. And they were all about trying to make sure we gave more wiggle room to everybody so that we all saw gender as a kind of spectrum and gender was fluid. And we didn't tell boys, you don't get to do that because you're a boy. And we don't tell girls, you can't do this um, or wear that or say that or, or work in this job because you're a girl. So they wanted that gender fluidity. They didn't think it, you had to sort of swap teams in order to do it. But then but then the gender non-binary people in some ways embody that now. And they go, right, I don't, I don't have to be one or the other. I, I, I don't have to identify either. I can reject this binary altogether and be gender non-binary. I have a great respect for someone who says, okay, well, I'm, I don't have to be either one. But, you know, don't pretend that you were born neither one necessarily. Again, that goes back to being essentialist, which is, again, that, that, that gender essentialism actually in some ways characterized the discourse of transsexuals, as they were called back then. Now they're called transgender. But people want to narrate their own lives in ways that somehow sound cohesive. So they, they can always, like you know, these women that talked about being super slutty and sleeping with men in bars in the bathrooms, which by the way, oh my God. Okay. Cause I, you know, don't know a lot of people who do that. I guess I don't get out much, but the doing that and then looking back at that and then saying, oh, now I have a, a way to explain what I was doing. that's based on how I'm living now. I mean, we all do that, right? You studied English literature, you know, how people, people need narratives that make their lives make sense. Right. So um, that's, uh, yeah, my, that's, it, everything is about narratives. I mean, my, you know, my most influential book ever for me is The Denial of Death, which is all about how basically every aspect of your personality is a defense mechanism narrative built up to protect you from the reality that you're this like dying creature. Yeah. Speaking of, you know, sort of getting embroiled in a kind of big contradiction um, I think the more universities try to be sensitive to different groups and different issues that are happening in the world, uh, the more easily they can be criticized because they don't ultimately uh, show a sensitivity to all the issues. And it goes back to in an effort to include some people, then you end up making other people feel excluded when you don't talk about their issues. And so it makes me wonder if universities should just get out of the business of trying to sound sensitive. But what happens is when you do it some of the time, and then you don't do it for a different group, or for, then you go, well, wait, you know, why, why didn't you do it for my group or for this group of people? What are they, do they, they're not worthy victims? Do we not care? Do you not see their victimization as part of a systemic sexism in our culture? Or, you know, I mean, you can't, you can't possibly ever account for all of the people out there because no matter what you do, it's going to screw somebody else up. 
You know, you can't like, like if you have, if the whole neighborhood has to have a speed limit of five miles an hour because there's one deaf kid that lives in the neighborhood somewhere, that's good for the deaf kid and bad for the whole rest of the neighborhood. I mean, okay, again, if you want to be consistent about this, it's like Bill Hicks used to say, like, let's see how committed you are to this premise. You know, I mean, like, how about all the other things that nobody is thinking about? And there's no way for all of us to think about every possible thing. But yeah. like one of my favorite little examples is, as I mentioned earlier, my entire life has been, you know, has been basically, you know, controlled by a, a crippling fucking agoraphobic OCD anxiety disorder. So, you know, let me tell you, you know, I can't even count the amount of times. I mean, basically, you just stop leaving the house sometimes because you can't take it. Because if you leave the house, you are going to get triggered and you are going to get fucked up and you're going to have problems. So I just want to go to the Starbucks and get a coffee. That's all I want to do. But I go, first, you know, I have to go stand in line and some asshole is coughing near me. And this is way before pandemic. I'm talking like I was always the guy. I was ready for the pandemic. I'm like, everybody should be wearing masks in here. What are these fucking assholes with the flu coughing all over me? Like, I can't even go out. I go out and some asshole goes, uh, you know, gosh, everybody's got the flu, huh? That's it for me. I'm out. I can't go out for three <laughs> weeks now. You know, thanks. Thanks for thinking of me. Or I'm just sitting down on a chair trying to drink my coffee. And some guy is sitting in the chair across from me with the newspaper fold it up because he's reading the paper but that means I have to look at the front page that has something about some goddamn virus or some tornado or something right and now I'm fucked up and I have to flee and go hide inside for the next three weeks and just wait to die or something you know or I just want to get my coffee and I'm in line and they've got a stack of newspapers sitting on the counter or sitting there so that in such a way that I cannot go to the counter and get my coffee without being forced to see news that I don't want to see I literally turn my head when I walk past a news box because I do not want to see news. And this is not because of the pandemic. I mean, the pandemic has just been like a germaphobe's worst nightmare, of course. You know, people call me and they're like, Jesus Christ, how are you doing in all this? And I'm like, I don't even hear that because I didn't answer the phone. The point is, it would never, literally, this, it's, it's, this is very true. You know, like I open up a newspaper. I remember one time, you know, you open up a newspaper and it's like, there's a whole spread about like meningitis because somebody 30 miles away from my town got meningitis and there's a whole one page spread about what happens to you if you get meningitis. And I'm like, this shit should not be allowed. Like I'm suddenly everyone I see, I'm, you know, this sounds like a joke. It's not for, for a germaphobe and for a hypochondriac and for somebody with real OCD, not like I like to keep my fucking desk clean. That's not what OCD is. You know, OCD is, you know, we'll get into that in my OCD podcast. Yeah. <laughs> but like, but like the point is, this is a very real thing. You want to talk about harm? This is a very real thing. Somebody leaves that newspaper open or somebody comes up and shakes my hand and gets in my face and then tells me that they're sick. You just fucked like a week of my life, okay? I am going to probably go home and just have to basically fend off a panic attack for the next like five days. This is not a joke. It's not funny and it's not, it's, I'm just not, I'm not trying to make some like little, some little academic comparison. Believe me, the harm that I suffer by the, the, the negative impact that I suffer because of this person's unintentional thoughtlessness point is it would never occur to me to think that I have the right to say, okay, coffee shops cannot sell newspapers anymore. People are not allowed to read newspapers in coffee shops because I don't want to see them. People are not allowed. If you cough and don't cover your mouth, you are going to be forced to go to an education class <laughs> about hygiene. I've always said that would be a good thing. Mm -hmm. You know, if you come up and sh shake my hand and then tell me you're sick, I was at a coffee shop where some girl, you know, the, 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 the barista literally like, God, how many times has this happened? They, they put their fucking entire hand, thumb, basically, their whole hand into your coffee cup. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, could you give me a coffee cup that you didn't just stick your entire fucking thumb in? Thanks. Or like coughing on your drinks and hand. I mean, my whole life is like that. My whole life is people fucking me up because of their thoughtlessness. Now, let's cut to just, you know, like with the trans thing or with any of this stuff, you know. 
if you unintentionally, that's like what got Jordan Peterson started. Was that whole C-16, whatever it was, bill in Canada where they wanted to, they were making this amendment that said, if you cause another person to experience negative impact, whether intentionally or unintentionally, by like misgendering somebody, then that could be potentially like a criminal offense or something, right? And it's that unintentional part. People do that to me every day. And the point is, I know this is a long story just for this, but the point is, nobody, we're not reshaping the way the whole world works to cater to OCD germaphobe, hypochondriacs like me. I'm out there, my whole life is basically just one big exercise in avoidance to try to stay away from people because people just, you know, fuck you up. That's what people do. I remember seeing Howie Mandel getting on a talk show and the talk show host, I can't remember who this was, Jimmy Kimmel or somebody, I don't know who, and he says, and he goes, like, you know, he, he mentions the fact that, you know, Howie Mandel is a big hypochondriac. And, hy- and Howie Mandel is like, yeah, it's true. And this asshole hosting the show gets up in his face, like comes around behind him and gets down in his face right next to his face. He goes, oh, am I spreading germs on you? I'm spreading germs. And Howie Mandel on this show, he actually jumps up and moves away from him. And he goes, come on, come on, come on. And you can tell he's legitimately upset. And I understand what he's going through. It probably fucked a week of his life. You know, and this asshole thinks that's funny. Like, can you imagine if you if you had a guest on your show who was like an alcoholic and then you pulled out a gin and tonic and went, don't you want some of this gin? It's pretty good. Or stuff. Try to try to you look down I mean? the shirt of a trans woman to see what their breasts look yeah. like or. And to get back to your example of, of, you know, maybe the university should just get out of the sensitivity business. Yeah. I mean, when did it become the business of universities to become to become these therapy centers in the first place. You know, when did the uni- when did we think that the job of the university and the purpose of education is to make people feel good about themselves and feel happy and safe and not threatened? Wasn't that the whole point of education was to do rather the opposite, to challenge your preconceived notions, to to unsettle your ideas, to make you uncomfortable? The just the rise of the whole rise of the therapy culture is something that is just like it's like the oxygen we breathe. You know, you just it's a completely invisible for me to say, you know, maybe like, you know, like at this point, one of the critiques of therapy culture is, you know, a person who wants to stand up for just the value of individualism or self sustenance, you know, <laughs> like, um, you know, self-management, I, I will manage my own emotions, thank you. Then, of course, it's so built into the system, immediately we know what that guy's deal is. That guy is in denial, he's repressing, it's unhealthy, it's time for an intervention. It's toxic masculinity, that's how they would say, describe it. That's exactly right. It is, it, it is, this is like this, 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 this uh, surely homophobic, toxic asshole man who thinks he has to do it all himself and thinks he can and doesn't want, you know, blah, blah, blah. Right. And it, that's why the victim culture continues. And, you know, you're the I'm the wrong kind of feminist if I suggest that it's a good idea that young women learn self-defense, especially yes. you know, there, there's a whole movement calling attention to the problem of violence against women, sexual assault on college campuses. But dare suggest on a college campus that we include self-defense training or even mention of self-defense training in all of their orientation sessions that teach sexual assault prevention. And you're heretical. They will look at you like you have three heads if you suggest self-defense, because that would assume also that, you know, there is a way around total victimhood um, it doesn't mean that it's ever a victim's fault if they're victimized, but there are things people can do to better their situation. As soon as you start talking about that, you get labeled a victim blamer rather than someone who's trying to empower people. And I think that's because of that therapeutic culture. It absolutely comes from that. And, you know, and you know what you're talking about here. I mean, right. You wrote your, your dissertation and your first book, right. Was on, was on, um, was on self defense, right? Yeah. Um, and so, right. This is this is, and that's a field of thought that is like completely passe now, right? Like you can't even bring up your own expertise anymore because it's now because now it's been recast as victim blaming. To to teach women how to defend themselves against sexual assault is the same thing as saying 
that they have some ability, they do have some, if you say women have an ability to defend themselves and they are anything other than just 100% helpless, that means it's their fault. So this brings me to one of my favorite themes, which is um, you ladies are going to have to make a choice. Do you want chivalry? Because that's what it sounds like you want. Because what you want is, like, for example, if you go out to a bar and have sex with a guy in a bathroom and then later you, you me to him because you say, yes, technically I consented. However, he should have known that that's not really what I wanted to do because he should have been able to tell that I was in a vulnerable space. Okay, so what you're asking for is for men to assume that women just – the way men used to see it women are women they don't they don't they they're ridiculous they're themselves. hysterical they can't think for themselves they don't know their own minds i know your mind better than you know your mind i hear you saying yes but what you really mean is no that if you want that then you also are going to get this i hear you saying no but what you really mean is yes no has to mean no but yes can't mean no also and if it does that means we're back to chivalry where i'm saying you know, I'll take care of you. I hear what you're saying, but you, you, you know, women do not know their own minds. So do you want us to protect you against yourselves? Because that's chivalry. They, they, it's also chivalry, right, when you expect that um, women who are in a vulnerable position at a party or wherever um, need to wait for the, a bystander who's been trained in a bystander intervention program to come intervene and save them from an assailant. Now, oh, that'd be great if everybody who is about to be victimized could be saved by someone else. And, uh, but in reality, sometimes you have to be your own bystander and intervene on your own behalf because there isn't anybody else there to save you. But this idea that what we should be doing is teaching men not to rape and teaching um, men and women to be intervening bystanders presumes that you can't ever teach a woman or shouldn't ever teach a woman to intervene on her own behalf because they're so afraid it's victim blaming. But it ultimately then assumes that you're just waiting for some big strong man to come save you at, or you're, you're hoping he'll use his, his strength and power for good and not evil. And, and it's just a, such a weird position, to, a weird way to frame uh, men. For one thing, you can't um, you can't suddenly um, fall back on your own gender and fall back on classic chivalrous gender constructions when it becomes convenient and when you need them again after devoting the rest of your life to throwing men under the bus and convincing them that they're all toxic pieces of shit who should burn in hell. Because the men are tired of it. They're like, fuck you guys. I'm not even going to open the door anymore. You know, because we're tired of opening a door for a woman only to have her slam it on our hands and, and tell us to go fuck ourselves. And we're also <laughs> tired of like listening to women bitch about feminism for like an hour and a half at the bar and then like pick a fight with a 300 pound guy because they know that the men around her are going to protect her and they know that the, the guy isn't going to hit the woman. If we had true gender equality, then I could punch a woman in the face and no one would care. Because if, if I punched a guy in the face, then that would be, you know, I don't do that. I don't punch people in the face. I don't, I don't get into fights. Plenty of people have tried to start fights with me because for some reason people always want to get into fights with me even though I don't know what <laughs> it is. But, you know, people, you know, I don't get into fights. Uh, however, if I did... A whole room full of people would sit there and watch me and another man fight. A whole room full of people would not sit there and watch me and a 90-pound girl fight. Right. You know, although they would watch me, kind of a string bean, fight against some big beefy guy. Nobody would Nobody would feel like they needed to rush in and protect me because all those gender differences are going to are gonna be very apparent to everybody. And all the feminists in the room and all the every, – everybody's going to know the rules all of a sudden and they're going to care about them. But – you know, just quick to come back to the, what you're saying about self-defense, you know, it's such a great example. You told me, uh, I can't, this was like a couple of years ago, you had some sort of conference you had to go to or it was something <laughs> you, were, you had like a – some like women's safety person came in or something to, to talk to your group or something and she yeah. said something like um, – like, I think a woman she walk across campus. Yes. Naked. She said something like, yeah, I can tell that story. Yeah, you tell me that story. Cause yeah. I, and then I want to, and then I tell me that story and then I want to just rail about it. <laughs> so with, you know, it, once universities were told under the Obama administration to consider sexual assault on campus, uh, as covered under the sex 
discrimination that Title IX prohibits uh, in any educational institution that receives federal funds, more and more campuses, mine included, had all of these Title IX trainings, right? And they, they had they had little flyers called Know Your Nines. And um, a lot of it, what they focused on was sexual assault on campus. And it was ultimately conceived of as what they call a train the trainers, where, you know, I was then supposed to go do the same kind of training with other people who I supervised or whoever on campus. So she, so I was the only one that really questioned anything. And one of the things that, you know, we, I noticed is that no discussion of self-defense or and, and teaching women any strategies, no data on how effective verbal and physical resistance can be, um, especially against an unarmed assailant, which is the typical assailant on a college campus. There was no discussion made of this. And finally, I said something about, well, you know, what we're talking a lot about, you know, what men are supposed to do or not do or what, you know, and it, uh, all the ways we're going to sort of control the culture to prevent uh, perpetrators from perpetrating. But what what about is there is there something women can do that would be empowering for them? And she says, I should be able to walk across campus naked and nothing should happen to me. And so of course, that, that's true for all of us. And, and, and you should be able to walk through any big city with $3 million worth of jewelry on uh, and not be robbed. But that's not realistic, right? People don't do that. They, they know that there are certain precautions that they take, right? You should be able to drive your, what's an expensive car, like your Bentley or your Ferrari and leave all your stuff in it unlocked and leave the keys in it but i don't know that anyone works. would actually do that because they don't want their car or their stuff stolen i would also say that um that if anyone did do that their friends would go what the fuck is wrong with you like if i got robbed because i was walking through some shady part of town at three in the morning in a white leisure suit with five thousand dollars hanging out of my top pocket everybody would go man i'm really sorry that happened but what were you thinking and no, and of course, this is the problem. It's a great example of how good intentions, something that begins with good intentions. Like you go back to something that's just bad. We all know it's bad. Like a woman gets, gets sexually assaulted and, you know, has the bravery to take it to the courts. And the judge says, you know, uh, you know, is that the dress you were wearing? You know, that's where it begins. A, a good place where we're going like, that's not cool. Don't blame the victim. And what we end up with is... A woman saying, you know, can I dress like a prostitute and go to a frat party and pole dance for like five guys and give them all lap dances and say to them, please fuck me in the back room right now and not have them get the wrong idea and sexualize the situation? Well, no, you can't. <laughs> awesome. well, that, that's where, yeah, it's go, it goes too far. And we, and we also then rob women of the information they need to protect themselves. Yes. It doesn't mean that if they become a victim of a crime, it wasn't really a crime. That's or right. It was in any way. Of course, it's the moral, legal uh, responsibility of the perpetrator for perpetrating the crime. But but that's, it, it's not going to help you also, when you're the one who gets raped. It's not going to help you to go like, you know, well, he shouldn't have done that. It is a dangerous, I think, this, I think this is what you're saying, is that it's, you know, this is actually a dangerous disservice to women. At this point, we have taught a couple of generations of women now that it's not their job to protect themselves. They, you're living on a safety playground. Everything is a safety playground now. I mean, that's what safety playgrounds are. We tore, back in my day, we had rusty metal jungle gyms. I fell off of one of them and busted my head open on the blacktop. And you know what? I learned, I know, I sound like some crazy old conservative guy, like, you know, we knew that the, the, the black that time, the, the jungle gym was where we tested boundaries. We learned, you know, you learn, you make a mistake, you fall, you crack your head open, you won't do that again. But it's absolutely true. You do kind of learn. You learn the principle that it's your job to protect yourself and you learn, you push boundaries and you fall and you hurt yourself and you go, well, I won't do that again. The safety playground, we tore all the jungle gyms down. We built safety playgrounds. The function of a safety playground is to prevent you from hurting yourself. We are not going to let you hurt yourself. That's the moral yeah. lesson that is imparted to you. But it turns out, as they've realized recently through research, which is that 
people hurt themselves worse on safety playgrounds because a whole couple generations have been taught that it's not their job to protect themselves. A, Big Brother's going to take care of it for you. And B, you can do whatever you want. You can't get hurt. Don't worry. And translate this to those same kids growing up and being told that they should be able to walk down the middle of the, of, of the promenade naked in the dark and nothing bad should happen. If I can just tell one news story that that reminds me of, uh, several years ago, I don't know if you remember, some brilliant parents decided they went down to Disney World um, in, in uh, Florida. Oh, they decided yeah. it would be a good idea to go into the swamp with their children. There were signs everywhere that said, do not go into the swamp. There are alligators here. They, you know, it's not safe. And they decided to go in anyway. And they had like a three-year-old who was killed. And people were outraged. That's and I so remember awful. a, uh, uh, you know, female acquaintance of mine at the time who said, <laughs> you know, who was the classic nightmare of like, I mean, all she ever did was, was, was tell stories about how she voluntarily went into the most ridiculous, dangerous, obviously sexual situations and then end up having horrible experience and talking about how, well, I thought it was a safe environment and it turned out that this guy had really bad intentions. And anybody listening to the story is like, of course he had bad intentions. What are you talking about? I mean, of course, that's what, that's what the situation was. This happened and she goes, what were these people thinking? I mean, you don't, she literally says... You don't go into an alligator's house and not expect to, you know, get fucked up by an alligator. So she had so she was perfectly fine blaming uh the the parents for losing their child, but she wouldn't have ever blamed a woman. Um so that that's interesting that people can make distinctions. But in, in but back to the victim blaming in general. I mean, what what we've done is in an effort to avoid blaming victims, uh, we've allowed a whole bunch of women to go into harm's way completely unarmed, if you will. So we we didn't we were saying that we would rather a whole bunch of women not learn how to defend themselves, and a, it's just in case it makes some victims feel bad about having been victimized. I'd rather deal with the ones who feel bad and make sure we clarify that we're not blaming them for their victimization. I mean, so, because again, imagine if you did that with the alligators. Let's take away all the signs. Let's not limit where anyone can go. And and let's not blame anybody but whoever runs the grounds of the places that have alligators because we don't want them to be blamed. We need to educate the alligator. You know, the alligator The alligator needs to be made to understand. You're blaming these parents for taking a three-year-old into a swamp filled with alligators when what you need to understand is that, you know, these alligators are part of a toxic culture. They've been socialized to think that it's okay to eat three-year-olds who wander into their swamp. And, uh, you know, we need to... We need to make these alligators understand that you just can't go around eating people, you know. But of course, that's not how the world works. And I'm not saying that all like, <laughs> unlike a lot of men lot are of, alligators. I'm not saying men are alligators; they can't help yeah. it. But what I'm saying is, the world is a fucked up place. And teaching women that to even think that maybe they should learn to defend themselves in case somebody tries to assault them is victim blaming. You're just going to end up with more people getting assaulted because. It's it's also people act like you can't do both things, like as if you can't teach men not to rape or teach anyone. I think we should be teaching women not to rape and assault, too, because, of course, they can perpetrate. It may not be as common, but it's probably increasingly common. And that's only a theory. But but this whole idea that I mean, I've seen women slap guys on the ass and do all kinds of things that are totally sexually harassing. I've seen much worse. They assume men always want it. So they assume it's invited when, of course, it wasn't invited. They do so because you assume that you assume that no, that 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 men you can't you can't rape a boy because he's always glad to 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 have a chance to to have sex with somebody. I heard a woman. Which is ridiculous. I heard a woman not that long ago, literally defending the woman who um um had the affair. You know, it was, it was a a thirty five year old woman or something having an having an ongoing affair with like a fourteen year old boy or something. And this woman literally so statutory rape. It was an obvious case of statutory rape, and and this woman who is the biggest feminist in the world who would rush to the defense of any anybody if the gender was reversed, she just goes like, "Yeah, but you know, he liked it." 
Oh my and god. And that is a very, very common thing. And I've known plenty of men who, believe it or not, have been cornered into sexual situations that they felt pressured to take part in, even though they didn't want to, yep. even saying no over and over and over again. I've seen plenty of women pressure a woman basically just trying to force herself onto you and thinking it's funny. But it, it's also the case that, yes, we should be teaching sexual assault prevention um, in all ways to all genders. And we should be teaching, uh, and, and to say that we can teach self-defense techniques, verbal and physical boundary setting, does not mean you're not also trying to prevent perpetration in the first place. I mean, I can walk and chew gum at the same time. <laughs> I can teach both. I can teach the people how to set boundaries and I can teach people how to respect boundaries. And in fact, teaching how to set boundaries is often a good way to teach someone how to respect boundaries. So it's it's so funny. We just want to leave a whole group out of the picture uh, and, and not really target them for intervention when that could be a very effective right. way to target. But it's it's all these ways we allow the therapeutic narrative concern for how people are going to feel blamed and and in general this kind of um an ideology we let that trump the data and the science that tells us what works we 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 have a lot of science on what prevent helps prevent sexual assault but we don't follow it we are ignore when you ignore the science for politics what you're saying is Basically, you know, you're, you're, you're throwing a lot of women, you're actually throwing women under the bus by doing that. Yep. Insisting that women learn to protect themselves is actually protecting women and helping them. And that's what feminist, uh, that's a feminist act. And instead, it's cast as a, a misogynistic, victim blaming, rape apologist yeah. attitude. Yeah. Feminists all over the internet attacked uh, the Miss USA pageant. A winner when she answered the Q and A section of the contest. What would you suggest we do about the problem of sexual assault that's rampant on college campuses today? This was like I don't know five years ago or something. She's like, "Well, I have a black belt in karate or something, and I, I find it really empowering. I think we could offer." self-defense training she didn't even say make women who don't want to take she didn't talk about coercing anybody she just said i think we could offer that to women and that could help they, they it was just all over the internet you know she was the devil for suggesting anything that targeted women rather than that targeted men who are seen as the perpetrators Women cannot have any any accountability, and which brings us to the question of, you know, like, which is it, ladies? Do you want to be empowered equals of men, or do you want to be these helpless, powerless, frail creatures who don't know their own minds and cannot speak their own truth, who need to be protected from themselves by men? Which is it? You can't have it both ways. Oh. 